Hi everyone. Welcome to this, the last session of the first day of the Cambridge Live experience. Uh, I hope you've been enjoying a lot of the other fantastic sessions going on today. But if this is your first session of the day, uh, you're in for a treat. Because today we have, now we have the fabulous Dr. Heike Kruzman talking about engagement, confidence, and success. Uh, now, let me just say that as you're listening to her, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask her, please put them in the chat box or the Q&A box, and we'll capture those um, and try and put as many of, uh, many of those as we can to her at the end of the session. Now, let me introduce Heike. She's a language researcher and writer with a keen interest in creativity and a PhD in motivation for language learning. She has many years of experience teaching English and other languages to learners from primary through to adult. After researching teen motivation for language learning at Oxford University's Creative Multilingualism Research Program, she joined the language research team, that's my team, at Cambridge University Press as a learner engagement specialist. Heike blogs on language, culture and creativity, and is a regular contributor to the European Literature Network. She's even authored an Oxford City Guide. She's an enthusiastic cyclist, traveler, maker of things and consumer of green smoothies, and all at the same time, if she can do that. You can find her or you can follow her on Twitter, at Dr. Heike K, for daily snippets from the wondrous world of language learning and teaching. So Heike is going to talk about engagement, confidence and success with practical ideas for the classroom. I'm going to hand over to you now, Heike. Okay, thank you very much, Ben, for some wonderful introduction. I'm going to share my screen if I can. Okay, so hopefully you should be able uh, to see what I'm sharing with you. Okay, so um, welcome every, um, everyone to my talk. It's really so wonderful to see uh, so many of you here and I've been um, watching the chat box um, uh, and all the places, the wonderful places in the world that you're saying hello from. That is really amazing to see and thank you so much from joining, for joining. So my talk today uh, is about learner engagement. And this is probably one of the key topics that is now more than ever, perhaps um, at the forefront of every teacher's mind. So today we're going to look at the questions, what is engagement, what are engagement, um, what are the building blocks of engagement? And then we're going to share some ideas of what you can do in your own teaching to engage language learners. And um, during the talk, you're very, very welcome to type into the chat box. And the chat is an opportunity for us to connect and for you to share your thoughts with me. And I might ask you every now and then um, to type your thoughts into the chat because this is a very good way for us to interact. So to start with now, I have a little fun challenge for you. And that challenge is that near the end of this session, I will ask you to type into the chat box a few things that you learned about me during the talk. And every now and then during my talk, I will drop in little bits of snippets of a fact about me. And so it's an invitation to you to keep an ear out for that. Okay, so engagement. What is engagement? The definition of engagement that I'm going with today is from a new book by uh, Sarah Mercer and Zoltan Donier, and they are both very much um, respected researchers in the field of language learning motivation and engagement. And the book is called Engaging Language Learners in Contemporary Classrooms. And I've got um, a copy here. You can see it's very, very well worked through. And um, I wanted to share this publication with you because the research and the ideas that I'm talking about today are uh, very much um, aligned uh, with this work. And the shared focus that we have is looking at research on language learner engagement in terms of helpfulness for teachers. So hopefully you will find this helpful because that's the whole idea. So Sarah Mercer and Zoltan Dunia, did they define engagement then as active participation and involvement in learning activities? So let's think about that for a moment. Active participation 
and involvement in learning activities. So very often people ask, well, what is the difference between engagement and motivation? So the key difference is that you can be as motivated as you like. Maybe you have some very important or overarching reasons for learning English. But if you're not actively participating, if you're not involved, then you're not learning. And often when we're talking about motivating learners, what we really mean is engaging learners in the learning task and in the face of many distractions coming their way, especially in the form, uh, for example, of uh, mobile phone apps. And these, these things are all designed to hijack our attention. And certainly in my own teaching, and I've taught all age groups, but mainly teenagers and adults, and I've certainly experienced students getting very distracted by mobile phones. And maybe you can share in the chat whether you've also experienced this. So just by typing the word yes, if you've also experienced um, your students getting distracted by, uh, by mobile phones, and I can see a sea of yeses coming up already. So this is, um, this is something that concerns all of us. Now, it's probably also fair to say that even if students don't really want to give in to these distractions, often they just don't know how to escape from this magnetic pull. And this is exactly where you as a teacher can come in to help them, right? To help them focus and to engage them on the task. So how do you do that? So here at Cambridge, we've identified some key factors that we know from research are the six building blocks of language learner engagement. And I would like to go through these six building blocks now with you and together we will look at selected research insights for each one and then we will suggest some action points which you can implement in your own teaching. Okay, so let's think about a situation that many of us are facing right now and this is certainly the case in the UK where I live that you're going to see your class in person again for the very first time in many months and you know that some students will have done all the work that you set and they will have made good progress, but some of them, they will have done none of it. And some of them, you don't even know if they're still around. They might, you might not even have heard from them. So um, you're raring to go. You're getting, you want to get stuck in. There's massive pressure to get things done, to catch up on missed work and to start new work. So you breeze into your classroom on a Monday morning and you say, happy Monday, everyone. And then all your students are looking at you like this. Okay, so now what happened there? Can you type in the chat box maybe just one word that expresses how you think your students are feeling at that moment with that kind of expression on their face? Okay, fed up, I'm reading fed up, lazy, embarrassed, bored, miserable. Okay, so unmotivated, very good, okay. So um, all of these words that you are typing there, you're getting a kind of feel for the mood there because um, uh, it might not be a happy Monday at all for your students, right? So maybe they're not feeling um, very sure of themselves. They, they might be quite anxious. They, have, they certainly will have other things on their mind. And um, maybe they've uh, witnessed and even gone through all kinds of trauma. You just don't really know what happened to them in the time that you've not seen them. So your mind may be very focused on the importance of getting work done, but your students may not be in the best frame of mind to even take in anything that you're saying to them let alone engage with any learning tasks that you might, might give them. So it's very, very important that when we're thinking about learner engagement, that we start right at the beginning. And that's the social relatedness amongst the people in your class. And I can't stress enough how important this is. So we know from research that our willingness to engage in learning is strongly affected by social relations uh, within the group. And that refers to two relationships. And the first one is the relationship between you as the teacher and your students. And you can perform the most singing, dancing, um, teaching roadshow with all the latest technology and all the resources. If you don't have a good relationship with your students, if your students don't believe that you genuinely care about them, then they're very unlikely to be willing to engage. And they'll probably look back at you much like that cat was looking back at us in the picture just there. The second very important aspect of social relatedness is the peer-to-peer -peer relationship amongst the students themselves. So learners also need to feel comfortable in, in interacting with others in the group so that they feel happy about trying out new language and giving and receiving peer feedback. And studies have shown that students who do have positive relationships with their peers have also higher levels of engagement, motivation, and achievement. And that's what we want. So it's very clear from the research, and I'm guessing probably also from your experience as teachers, 
that a positive supportive group culture underpins all learner engagement. And there are a number of features that successful groups have in common and that you can use to support social relation relatedness and therefore learner engagement. So for example, successful groups have what's called a group legend and you can support this through a group name or group symbols, maybe a mascot, a motto or a logo. And through all of this, you're creating a sense of belonging and of trust amongst the group members. And so other things you can do in the classroom to support the social emotional climate in the group would be to share something personal with your students, because this also builds a relationship of trust. So I would say also encourage your learners to share something appropriate with the rest of the class. For example, you could um, invite them to bring in an object and talk, to, talk about it for a minute. And that's often called a show and tell kind of activities. And these kind of activities are really great and they work well online in a whole group or you could use breakout rooms for smaller groups uh, to save time and still everybody gets a chance to talk. So, for example, uh, me personally, I like to travel and um, you may have guessed this looking at the big map of the world uh, surrounded by postcards in the background behind me. Not that there's much traveling going on at the moment, but I might still show my class a postcard and start a discussion that way. And postcards are a really good hook for creating a talking point. And you could even start a class collection of postcards or any picture cards that learners can bring in. They don't have to have been to the place that's shown on the card. Anything that they may have an interest in and want to talk about. And this again would be a great way to share something personal, which strengthens connections within the class. Second, it's also very much worth thinking about what is referred to as the three R's. And the three R's here are rules, roles and routines. And it's especially important to think about rules afresh for returning to the face-to-face -face classroom in a socially distanced way, because we're going to have some changes. And so you can use the new context to involve your students in discussing the rules and why they are necessary and explain that they are there to keep everybody safe. And again, you're showing your students that you care about them. Roles are helpful for students to concentrate on a specific responsibility. So you could assign different roles for students for group work and then you could swap roles so students are learning different skills. For example, roles could be a fact checker or a note taker or a spokesperson, a summarizer, timekeeper and so on. And the last R stands for routines. So routines really help us to provide a structure and security and this is especially important when things feel uncertain, as they may feel at this current time. And it helps everyone to feel a little less overwhelmed by the situation. And all of these three R's of rules, roles and routines, they can all be implemented very well online, as well as in the face-to-face -face classroom. The third action point for supporting social relatedness is to use collaborative tasks as much as possible. And um, so you can use smaller groups or even just in pairs. Um, and this is a good way to strengthen bonds between learners. And it also teaches um, students collaboration skills. This is a key life competency and it will come in useful uh, very much beyond the language class as well. And one idea for the socially distanced classroom where you can't really have learners move around and be in cl close proximity to each other for small group work would be to have um, the whole group stay where they are, but single out a few individual learners dotted around the classroom and give them a colored card to show which, um, which people are in one group together. And so then they could do a speaking task out, out loud and the rest um, of the class could listen and make notes and learn from it. And then you could give um, another group that opportunity. So every student has had a chance to get involved before you open up the whole group discussion. And um, these kind of activities, if you're interested in more uh, like that for the socially distanced classroom, there are some really excellent talks in this program specifically on this topic and also several other talks which focus on the individual building blocks of engagement. So do have a look at the program if there is anything you hear today that you would like to get into in more depth. Staying with social related, relatedness for a little bit longer, I would like to now invite you to suggest by typing in the chat what kind of activities you think would work in your own teaching to strengthen teacher-student rapport and build positive group dynamics. And so um, while you're having a think and maybe typing some, I've put a few examples on the slide um, for you here. So number one, 
represents setting up group rules and you will find uh, in quite a lot of ELT textbooks this kind of activity is there already not just for younger learners as in this example here but also for any age of and level of learner really because as we said this would be a good starting point and uh, number two is an example of using the Padlet tool and this is an excellent tool for whole class collaboration and you could also use it as a class wall to um, visually represent a group kind of identity, which is what we talked about. And number three, this is a show and tell type um, activity where someone can bring in an object and talk about it and you could start a discussion that way. And these would just be a few examples of activities that would strengthen the social relatedness within your class. And I can see people are typing some really excellent um, sharing a story, badges, uh, group projects, absolutely, totally, yes telling true truths run lie. This is a fantastic activity. Thank you so much um, for sharing with your, these are, these are all uh, fantastic ideas and I, I can tell you, um, you, uh, you know what I'm talking about by uh, taking that idea and running with it. Okay, so let's um, uh, cut to the next uh, building block of engagement though that I've prepared for you and this is self-efficacy. And self-efficacy is the belief of I can do it. And research tells us that we engage more in learning if we believe that we can be successful in a task. And for this, though, it's very important that the task is just challenging enough to be manageable, but still represent an achievement. Also tied in with this notion of self-efficacy is the idea of a growth mindset. And a growth mindset means a belief that improvement is possible and that it's this belief which enables learners to deal better with difficulty and setbacks because it helps them to frame these as challenges that can be overcome. So what do we need to do to support self-efficacy? So we need to provide plentiful opportunities for success and you can do that by setting incremental, incremental goals at increasing level of challenge so that you give learners the confidence that they can be successful at a task by staggering achievements. And for this, you will most likely need to use differentiation. So for example, you could set a reading task where the text and the questions are getting increasingly more challenging. And then you can say to learners, okay, so this text starts off very easy, but it gets harder with each paragraph. So I'd like you to choose where you start. Look at paragraph one. If that's too easy for you, go to paragraph two and start there. If you're feeling more confident, start with paragraph three and so on. So students choose their own starting point. And in that way, you've only had to design one single activity for the whole class, and this saves you preparation time. And it also, this activity builds up the challenge in incremental step, steps, and it offers differentiation. And because you're offering learners a choice, you're also supporting their agency, and this is another factor for engagement, as we will see in just one minute. Second, though, for self-efficacy is make progress visible. And sometimes it's very hard for learners to see how far they've actually come already. And you can help them with that. You can help them build their confidence by visualizing their achievements. And it's actually really important to celebrate small wins and not just the big milestones. And a few ways in which you can do that, for example, is through a traffic like system or exit tickets where learners rate their understanding of the lesson at the end of every lesson. And so, for example, there's a free formative assessment tool, Socrative, and there, there are others as well um, that do this task very well. You could also use student portfolios, and this is where students collect samples of their work throughout the course. And it's very satisfying then to look back and see how far you've come already. And again, this can be done on paper and displayed in class, as well as digitally online. The last point is feedback. Feedback is crucial to get right. And to my mind, the most important thing to bear in mind about feedback so that is that it should be encouraging for learners and it should be meaningful. And this means that it's not good enough to say to learners, well done, you've done a good job and then move on, but to use SMART criteria, S-M-A-R-T, and we probably all know and not always love these for our own goal setting for CPD, but I still think that um, the SMART system works very well for feedback. So we've got to be specific in our feedback to learners, setting measurable and achievable goals. The feedback has to be relevant and it's got to be delivered in a timely manner so that the moment that window of opportunity for learning is not lost. 
Okay, so instilling an I can do it mindset in learners might remind you just a little bit of positive psychology. There's a lot of it around um, at this moment in time. It's focusing on positive self-talk and on positive attitudes. And you wouldn't really be wrong in thinking that. But there is also a slight danger in this way of thinking in that if you're not careful envisaging positive outcomes can feel a little bit like wishful thinking. And there's actually some research which shows that if people dream too much about achieving their goals, they actually achieve less than if they didn't do this. And that's because if in their dreams they've already achieved their goal, then they might feel less of a drive in real life to move them to put in the effort required to actually make things happen. So I'd like to share with you a goal setting tool that I really like, and that's called the WHOOP tool. And it was developed by Gabrielle Oettingen, and it's from her book, Rethinking Positive Thinking. And WHOOP is an acronym, and this stands for WISH, Outcome, Obstacle, and Plan. And you can use this with students for achieving their goals by helping them to anticipate obstacles to their learning, and then identify strategies to overcome these obstacles. Let's take an example. So for example, a student's wish could be to improve their grammar skills. And the outcome for them would be, to, uh, would be that they would do well in their end of year exam. And this will then open more opportunities uh, for them in life. And you can see how it spirals. But when we come to the obstacle, there's a very important rule. And the rule is you're only allowed to list something inside of you that is stopping you from achieving your, your goal. And this does away with all the excuses that we're all in the habit of making why something can't be done. And the idea is that you realize, once you realize that it was you who put the obstacle there in the first place, then you can also overcome it. And you can overcome it by setting a path to action with an if-then scenario. So I'm giving you an example uh, from myself. An example would be that I'm also very easily distracted by alerts coming up on my phone. And two of my favorite phone apps that can really set my attention are Twitter and Instagram, and I really love them. So I've made a rule for myself that if I'm working on the computer, then I will turn my phone notifications off. And maybe you can also think of some ways in which you can use the WHOOP tool with your students to help them not just to set, but actually to achieve their goals, which is what, uh, what it's all about. And like me, you may then also find that this works for yourself and for your own goals um, as well. Okay, next I have a question for you and I'm giving you a choice now. And in fact, um, uh, the choice uh, of what we're going to do next uh, is green or blue. And um, so Eve has um, helped by setting up a poll for this. So Eve, if I could ask you to um, start the poll. So you've got uh, two options there and they are green or blue. So the choice between what we're going to do next is green or blue. So can you, um, uh, can you just click on the poll, but which one you want to do. And this is just going to uh, be open for five seconds. So I'm just going to count down uh, I'm going to vote myself as well. Uh, count down from five, four, three, two, one. And Eve, if you could, if you could share the result of the poll with us. Okay, so um, I can tell that over a thousand of you voted for green, that's 58%, and then slightly fewer of you voted for blue, that's 42%. And um, I think if you are watching on Facebook Live, you cannot see this, so I apologize for this, but um, they were going to go with green because that was the uh, majority um, of the vote. So this brings us then uh, to the next building block of learner engagement, which is agency. And research into learner agency tells us that we learn better when we can control aspects of what, when, and how we learn. And maybe you can take a moment to notice just how you were feeling when I just offered you a choice there. So you were exercising your agency, even though you didn't even know what it was all about, green or blue, it was a, a little bit random, but um, maybe you can just sort of go into yourself and think, um, how, did, how did I feel when, I, when, I, uh, when it appeared to me that I was given a choice? So in your teaching, wherever possible, provide opportunities for choice and voice. And I really like this phrase, choice and voice, because it's a very catchy phrase and it exp expresses in a very clear way what we should try and build into our teaching. It's easy to remember, choice and voice. But 
rather than go completely laissez-faire and to avoid making our choices too overwhelming, it's a really good idea to keep them contained within a structure. So for example, for a writing task, uh, you could offer students at least two options for the output format. So for example, um, the task could be to write a formal letter or an informal text message, but the message would, be, would have the same content. Or you could keep the format the same, but you could offer a choice on the content. So the task could be to write a blog post to persuade readers to donate to a charity, but then you could uh, let students choose which charity they want to choose, which is close to their heart, that they would actually want people to support. The second point to support learner agency says that what we want to do is to foster a culture of learner-centered learning. And for this, project-based learning is ideal. And I noticed that some of you already typed in project-based learning and um, you are absolutely right because projects are brilliant for um, supporting learner agency because they put learner into, learners into an active role and um, projects allow learners to make decisions. And if you're involved in a project, you have a very specific role with very tangible outcomes. Like for example, if you're acting in a play, you can't just sit there and let it all wash over you. You have to participate. You just have to engage through the very nature of the task. The last point is to think of yourself as the teacher you think of yourself, you're the teacher, but think of yourself not as the teacher, but as a coach rather than as a teacher. Now, what's the difference? It's more of a mental shift in how we often traditionally think of ourselves as teachers, but it might be helpful to reflect on that if we want the learner to be at the center of their own learning, then this means we as the teacher we have to give the learner some space. So we have to move a little bit away from the center. We have to make room. And um, then we can support the learner um, from the sidelines a bit more like a coach. And so in the classroom, this means not just focusing on our students' language achievement, but also on their psychological state and teaching them more general learning strategies and skills. Right, so now I have a little task for you and I want to show you a reading text, which is the text here uh, on the yellow background. Now there is no need at all to actually read the text, right? This is just to give you an idea of the kind of source text that might typically be used in ELT. Obviously it would very much um, depend on what, uh, what level and what age group you're teaching, but um, I would like to invite you to have a think of some ways in which you could use a text like this or a similar text in your own teaching in a way that supports learner agency. And I've put a reminder on the left of the screen here of what aspects you could think about for this. And the aspects are choice and voice, project-based learning, and teaching learning to learn skills. So feel free to type in the chat box your ideas of how you could use this um, in your own teaching to increase learner engagement. And uh, it's, it's flying by, but I'm going to try and um, and read some. Yes, some, some people uh, recognize where that text is from, but it doesn't really matter where it's from. It's really just an, an example, uh, choice and voice. Yeah, people are um, saying that. So let's start with choice and voice. So you see that again, I numbered the paragraph. I love, this is usually the first thing I do when, uh, when I'm teaching um, using a reading text. Um, you can number the paragraphs. And um, so like in the example for self-efficacy that we had earlier, you can give learners a choice which paragraph uh, they like to choose. So you could divide up the text and um, you could give them a choice within a structure in that way. And you can also offer learners a choice of tasks. So there's no tasks um, that come with this text uh, for now. So you could offer them um, a, a you could offer them a choice of tasks. For example, you could use a, um, a choice board, which I've brought up here. So this is um, a bit like a noughts and crosses or sometimes also called a tic-tac-toe style board. And if you, can, if you put a task in each of the boxes, then learners can choose a task from each row. And again, it offers choice, but within a structure. And for the middle box, you see that there is a star there. Where the star is, you can then ask learners to come up with an idea for a task themselves, something that they actually would like to do. And this would be an opportunity then for learners to express their voice and make a meaningful contribution to the learning process. And also to support learner voice, you could offer learners the opportunity to express their opinions as part of the tasks that uh, you're using to exploit the source text. 
Now for project-based learning, you can build this text into a larger project where learners can choose their own focus. And this could be around a theme. So for example, here, themes that spring to mind are multinational companies or marketing or environmental concerns. Or you could also choose a language focus such as giving instructions. And all of these would be rooted in a real life situation. And that's usually at the heart of project-based learning. And for learning to learn, one way in which you could address it with a text like that would be to teach your students decoding strategies. And um, one of them might be to pay close attention to clues from the title or to images. This is something that learners very often ignore. You could um, show them how to work out the meaning of unknown vocab uh, from the adjoining words, from the co-text or from the general context. Or you could encourage them to use uh, their knowledge of cognates from the L1 or maybe from other languages. All of this is to provide them with a repertoire of strategies that they can then use to exercise agency and make choices which will engage your learners more fully. Okay, so we were talking about real life situations being at the heart of project-based learning. And this brings us to the next building block of engagement, which is relevance. And the research insight for relevance is that we are so much more motivated to engage when we feel that what we're learning is relevant to our personal life. And this means it's very important that we design, or at the very least we adapt, the tasks that we're setting for the learners that we're currently teaching. And it may sound obvious, but you might be, you might be surprised how, um, uh, how often this actually doesn't happen. And please don't worry, because what I'm not saying is to, that I want you to reinvent the wheel every time you start teaching a new group, not at all. Sometimes it could just mean making a very small but effective tweak to existing materials. And one technique I want to share with you that has worked very well for me in the past is that when you're planning a lesson, then don't focus on the whole group, just focus on one or two specific students in your group when you're planning your lesson rather than the whole group. And then when you plan the next lesson, focus on another subgroup. And if you do this, then you will make it more specific and you will strengthen the link between the materials that you're using and your learners. And some helpful questions for you to guide you in your lesson planning are, what do learners need? What are their current abilities? What do they like to do? So offering a variety is always a good idea in terms of engagement. What are your student goals, students' goals? And this is different from what your students need and what they like, because goals are about beliefs. And last, what are our learners' real lives like? This is a very important question to ask. And we need to really always consider the social context of our learners and be very sensitive in how we use language and lesson content and to be realistic in our outlook as well. Next is explain the value, purpose, and meaning in a task. And we know from research that learners really need to see the value in a task in order to engage with it fully. So it's a good idea to make this explicit for them. Or better still, get your students to work out what they think the value of the task is. Uh, let me ask you, have your students ever said to you, why are we doing this? Type yes if your learners have ever said to you, why are we doing this? Okay, if you're, if you're typing no, then, then well done, then you've obviously already explained that. But um, it certainly happened to me as well. And uh, I can see a lot of yeses there. So think for yourself, it's very important to know why we're doing anything, isn't it? Otherwise, if we don't know the reason for doing something, we're not particularly motivated to do it. And the fact that someone is making you do it without explaining why, that's really not good enough. So for sustainable engagement, we really need to go beyond the compliance phase and make the rationale clear. And last for relevance is offer opportunities to personalize activities wherever possible. And we already talked about that sharing appropriate personal details is a bonding thing to do. So um, if you have a task about talking about other people, for example, let learners choose who they want to talk about. For example, a famous person that they admire. So uh, an example from myself. So I like the comedian and presenter uh, Trevor Noah. So I might start off by showing a picture of Trevor Noah. So I'm uh, showing you his autobiography here. I might show this to learners uh, with his picture on. And I would model the expected outcome for my learners using a genuine, personal real life example and that usually sparks a, um, a brilliant conversation and then maybe learners can do the same they can bring in um, 
a picture of someone that they want to talk about or a book and that uh, would be much better than describing a generic photo or a generic person from a textbook uh, who doesn't even really exist. Okay, so at the beginning, I told you that I would be dropping in some factual details about myself all through this talk. And so now I'm asking you and just type in the chat box, what have you learned about me so far? And I can tell you there were five facts about me that I casually slipped into this talk at random in intervals and people are uh, typing it. Well done. So the five facts were I live in the UK. I taught all ages of learners, but mainly teenagers and adults. I like to travel if I can. I like Twitter and Instagram and they distract me quite a bit. And I like the comedian presenter Trevor Noah. Okay, well done. Well done all of you who noticed and remembered these little bits of inf information. But here's another question for you. Would you have noticed or remembered any of this if I hadn't told you to listen out for this? And my guess is you probably wouldn't. So if I hadn't alerted you to the fact that I was doing it, you probably would never have noticed this. So what I did is what is I activated your sense of curiosity. And we know from research, oops, and we know from research that um, curiosity is an important condition for learning and it can be triggered in response to uncertainty. So these facts about me, they would be new information for you, but also importantly, you never knew when the next one would happen. So there was some unpredictability around this. And we know from neuroscience that unpredictable rewards or stimuli are highly engaging. And in fact, much of the sometimes even addictive power of gaming is based on this concept. So you could do something similar in your lessons. You could tell learners to listen out for you mentioning five names of animals at random intervals and write them down or tick them off a bingo card or hold up, um, hold up a mini whiteboard, um, or that kind of thing. So, that was about random rewards, but it's also much more satisfying to discover something for ourselves rather than just be presented with the information. So, for example, if you think of two presents that you might be given, one is wrapped and one is not wrapped, which one is the more exciting present, the wrapped one or the, the unwrapped one? I think it's the wrapped one that's uh, more exciting. So, just in the same way, um, uh, you could... Uh, let learners find out things for themselves. And this is much more engaging than just presenting them with the information. So you could use this for topic content, but you can also use it for working out the rules of language and the discovery or the inductive approach where learners work out the rules for themselves based on examples and guidance. This is very popular for that very reason. Second, we all have an inbuilt urge to find out how things work. And that's what's sometimes called the mental itch. And I really like that expression, the mental itch. So you can create this mental itch that your students will then want to scratch by using elements of surprise or mystery. And we're all familiar with this very attention uh, grabbing uh, strategy, um, like using a cliffhanger, for example, in advertising that's used in films in books and in the media. We really know that this works. And one way uh, of using this in your own teaching would be to end on a cliffhanger and then get learners to speculate about what happened next. And this is also related to the last point, which is to use the power of stories. And again, as humans, we're all naturally attracted to a storyline. It's not just that we want to find out what happens next. It's also that we remember information more effectively when it's structured in narrative format, because this is a format that's very familiar to us and it even predates written forms of communication. And stories really appeal to everyone, um, not just to younger learners where they are most commonly used, really to everyone. You can use them, I've used stories with learners of any age and that stories as input, but also you can set creative tasks where learners are the storytellers. And of course that works with old school pen and paper, but also um, with some really lovely digital storytelling tools, like um, I've put a few together on the screen here for you. So there is Storybird and Storyboard and My Story. And I'm sure that um, you, you can think of other ones as well. If you can think of other ones, then do feel free to share them, uh, share them in the chat here. And I can see that uh, people are putting, putting some up. And last, don't forget to enjoy yourself. And this is official advice because we know from research that we are more motivated to engage in learning tasks that we enjoy. So especially in language learning, 
do foster positive emotions, do capture what's called FLE. That's actually a concept, foreign language enjoyment, FLE, because enjoyment is positively correlated with achievement. And this means we enjoy what we're good at and we're good at what we enjoy. So this is a win-win really. So do draw on humor, on getting learners active, on using visuals, music, again, you know you learn us best, so design tasks around what you both enjoy and what suits your context and the age group that you're teaching. Please don't be worried that if you're laughing with your class that the message could be that the lesson isn't serious or that it's not important. This is not the case at all. So we do take learning very seriously indeed, but that doesn't mean that we have to take ourselves too seriously. And so this can be done in a very authentic and lighthearted way. For example, if something amusing has happened to you in your real life that may be appropriate to share with your students, you could just try out doing that and see how that goes. And then you can also ask your students to share something funny with you in return. So do use activities with bo which both you and your learners enjoy together. Have some fun together. And your students seeing you enjoying teaching them and sharing a laugh with them, this will help them to connect with you on a human level. And it will again build social connections and trust. And it is this social relatedness that we've seen at the beginning, and I'm sure you all know this as practicing teachers, which is the underpinning of all successful learner engagement. And from this stems the other, stem the other building blocks of engagement, which we talked about, and they are self-efficacy, agency, relevance, curiosity and enjoyment. And if you address these building blocks in your teaching, then any activities based on them will be engaging for your, for your students. So hopefully this talk will have given you some ideas of tasks that can be engaging for learners, but most importantly, a sense of the bigger picture of the foundations that these kind of tasks are built on and why it really matters. Thank you very much for listening. Hi, Kate. Yes. Wonderful. That was a wonderful talk. And uh, I can tell you that there's a huge number of very positive comments coming in um, from, from the uh, audience there. Um, let me, my light's gone out. I'm just going to turn off the light, but I'm just going to yep. pick out a few questions that have come through okay. to, pe to people. Uh, first question is um, my students are simply not interested in learning English. They live in rural <laughs> Mexico. English is not needed. What can I do to motivate and to engage them? Okay. Um, well, I would say that um, there is always a way of getting your students to engage. And um, maybe, um, so you're saying your, your students aren't, aren't motivated at all. Well, they must be interested in something. What do they do in their, what do they do in their free time? What, what are their concerns? What are their lives like? Um, what, what are they interested in doing? If you can find out something that motivates them away from learning English, because the, the big chance in teaching a language is that it's, content free you can talk about anything and teach a grammar point right you can you can bring in vocab you can do so many things with teaching a language because you're not really uh, restricted with the topics so i would start by really having a discussion in um the learner's uh, first language if 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 need be to find out uh, what their concerns are and really get to know them and to show them look I really care about you. You've, you've, you've been put on this course. You might not particularly want to be there, but I'm here to help you um, get through this and we can do this together. And it doesn't have to be a grueling pro a process. Okay, how can we make this work? And I think quite often when people say that their learners aren't, aren't interested is um, that they're sort of at odds a little bit like we had that, um, that picture of the cat, that there is not, it, uh, not good communication, that the teacher doesn't really know what the learners want and where they're coming from. Um, so I wouldn't uh, sort of breeze in with the textbook and say, open your textbook, we're going to do task one, page, uh, page one, um, but sort of have a discussion to start with. It's all about good communication and laying the ground rules and finding out where your learner's coming from and what you can do to help them get interested. And I, I find that as um, when learners find out 
that you're you're on their side, right? You're you're there to help them, and you're in this together. That they open up um, to you, and maybe they can suggest something they would want to do. So they don't want to do what you're trying to get to do them. Well, ask them what they want to do. Fantastic. That's a great, great answer, Heike. Uh, I think we've got time for one more question. I'm sorry, there's so many questions. I've got hundreds of questions. Uh, one more question is, um, what about the difference between adults and children? Yes. I think there were particularly people thinking about young, children, young learners, uh, yes. primary. Um, do they need to think and reflect on why they're learning things or, or is it a different approach for them? Yeah, so that's a, that's a really good question because obviously young learners... Um, it's a little bit uh, that that's a, a little bit different because um, a, a, a rationale uh, uh, for something is uh, is maybe not quite as obvious to um, to early years uh, to early years learners where you have to do everything in a much more uh, playful playful way. Um, so um, it's also about um, uh, internalizing sort of outside um, outside norms and outside expectations. So the um, partly the the theoretical framework that I was talking about today was based on self-determination uh, theory. And the idea is that um, learners internalize the uh, expectations of, of society through a process of self-regulation and that they go from um, sort of more extrinsic motivation to a more intrinsic uh, motivation where uh, you you're then becoming interested in in the subject uh, in in the in the actual subject so for for very young learners um, it's um, it's often the case that you're working uh, that what what is success what can be successful in your teaching is um, some more sort of um, external rewards. So what works really well with, uh, with younger learners is, um, is badges and stars and very specific praise. I think you have to be very careful with praise to, uh, to make it specific um, and, and praise the, eff the effort and, and the purpose. And I think young learners uh, respond to that very well because they will then, they will then learn that if they do behave in a, in a certain way and then they get the get the things that they want so maybe um, they can they can collect even collect a colored paper clips or or pictures of animals or, or anything like that yeah. and the idea is then that through this process of self self-regulation and um, sort of internalizing of these external rewards that it will create a more um, intrinsic genuine interest in the in the in, in the learning content yeah Fantastic. Thank you so much, Heike. Uh, you really have to read the comments. There's so much praise there for your I'd presentation. People, oh, found you. it, people found it um, really inspiring. They loved your enthusiasm. You now have admirers in almost every country in the world. Lots Perfect. of uh, very positive co uh, comments. So uh, thank, you, thank you so much for a fantastic session. Really uh, engaging. Engaging, which is just oh, exactly brilliant. what you expect. And I'd like um, to say thank you so much, everybody, for your contributions. And this is this is just brilliant. I couldn't have done it with all your with all your responses. So I'm I'm really really pleased that you've um, that you've um, responded in this way. And good luck in your teaching. And you're all brilliant teachers. And go forth and spread the enthusiasm. <laughs> right. So so I, I hope. Um, that you've had a good day. A lot of you have been here from the beginning of the day with a lot of sessions. Um, this is the last session for the first day. Um, so we're going to draw to a close now. Um, please join tomorrow morning. I won't say a time because it depends which country you're in, but check the program uh, and uh, please join us. There's a lot more sessions like today's uh, tomorrow and the day after. Thank you very much for, for joining us.